From the American Experience Storybook, Ben Franklin, Part 2. Now, boys, cried Ben, let's give three cheers and go home to bed. Tomorrow we may catch fish at our ease. Hurrah, 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 shouted his comrades. They all went home in such an ecstasy of delight that they could hardly get a wink of sleep. In the morning, when the early sunbeams were gleaming on the steeples and roofs of the town and gilding the water that surrounded it, the masons came rubbing their eyes to begin their work at the foundation of the new house. But on reaching the spot, they rubbed their eyes so much the harder. What had become of their heap of stones? Why, Sam, said one to another in great perplexity, here's been some witchcraft at work while we were asleep. The stones must have flown away through the air. More likely they've been stolen, answered Sam. But who on earth would think of stealing a heap of stones, cried a third. Could a man carry them away in his pocket? The master mason, who was a gruff kind of man, stood scratching his head and said nothing at first. But looking carefully on the ground, he discerned innumerable tracks of little feet, some with shoes, some barefoot. Following these tracks with his eyes, he saw that they formed a beaten path toward the waterside. Ah, I see what the mischief is, he said, nodding his head. Those little rascals, the boys, they've stolen our stones to build a wharf with. The masons immediately went to examine the new structure, and to say the truth, it was well worth looking at. So neatly and with such admirable skill had it been planned and finished. The stones were put together so securely that there was no danger of their being loosened by the tide, however swiftly it may sweep along. There was a broad and safe platform to stand upon, whence the little fishermen might cast their lines into deep water and draw up fish in abundance. Indeed, it almost seemed as if Ben and his comrades might be forgiven for taking the stones, because they had done their job in such a workmanlike manner. The chaps that built this wharf understood their business pretty well, said one of the masons. I should not be ashamed of such a piece of work myself. But the master mason did not seem to enjoy the joke. He was one of those unreasonable people who cared a great deal more for their own rights and privileges than for the convenience of all the rest of the world. Sam, he said more gruffly than usual, go call a constable. So Sam called a constable, and inquiries were set on foot to discover the perpetrators of the theft. In the course of the day, warrants were issued with the signature of a justice of the peace to take the bodies of Benjamin Franklin and other evil-disposed persons who had stolen a heap of stones. If the owner of the stolen property had not been more merciful than the master mason, it might have gone hard with our friends Benjamin and his fellow laborers. But luckily for them, the gentleman had a respect for Ben's father, and moreover was amused with the spirit of the whole affair. He therefore let the culprits off pretty easily. But when the constables were dismissed, the poor boys had to go through another trial and receive sentence, and suffer execution too from their own fathers. Many a rod, I grieve to say, was worn to the stump on that unlucky night. As for Ben, he was less afraid of a whipping than of his father's disapprobation. Mr. Franklin, as I have mentioned before, was a sagacious man and also an inflexibly upright one. He had read much for a person in his rank of life and had pondered upon the ways of the world until he had gained more wisdom than a whole library of books could have taught him. Ben had greater reference for his father than for any other person in the world as well on account of his spotless integrity as of his practical sense and deep views of things. Consequently, after being released from the clutches of the law, Ben came into his father's presence with no small perturbations of mind. Benjamin, come hither, began Mr. Franklin, in his customary solemn and weighty tone. The boy approached and stood before his father's chair, waiting reverently to hear what judgment this good man would pass upon his late offense. He felt that now the right and wrong of the whole matter would be made to appear. 
Benjamin, said his father, what could induce you to take property which did not belong to you? Why, father, replied Ben, hanging his head at first, but then lifting eyes to Mr. Franklin's face. If it had been merely for my own benefit, I should never have dreamed of it. But I knew that the wharf would be a public convenience. If the owner of the stone should build a house with them, nobody will enjoy any advantage except himself. Now I made use of them in a way that was for the advantage of many persons. I thought it right to aim at doing good to the greatest number. My son, said Mr. Franklin solemnly, so far as it was in your power, you have done a greater harm to the public than to the owner of the stones. How can that be, father? asked Ben. Because, answered his father, in building your wharf with the stolen materials, you have committed a moral wrong. There is no more terrible mistake than to violate what is externally right for the sake of a seeming expediency. Those who act upon such a principle do the utmost in their power to destroy all that is good in the world. Heaven forbid, said Benjamin. No act, continued Mr. Franklin, can possibly be for the benefit of the public generally, which involves injustice to any individual. It would be easy to prove this by examples. But indeed, can we suppose that our all-wise and just creator would have so ordered the affairs of the world that a wrong act should be the true method of attaining a right end? It is impious to think so. And I do verily believe, Benjamin, that almost all the public and private misery of mankind arises from a neglect of this great truth, that evil can only produce evil, that good ends must be wrought out by good means. I will never forget it again, said Benjamin, bowing his head. Remember, concluded his father, that whenever we vary from the highest rule of right, just so far we do an injury to the world. It may seem otherwise for the moment, but both in time and in eternity, it will be found so. To the close of his life, Benjamin Franklin never forgot this conversation with his father, and we have reason to suppose that in most of his public and private career, he endeavored to act upon the principle which that good and wise man had then taught him. After the great event of building the wharf, Ben continued to cut wick yarn and fill candle molds for about two years. But, as he had no love for that occupation, his father often took him to see various artisans at their work in order to discover what trade he would prefer. Thus Ben learned the use of a great many tools, the knowledge of which afterwards proved very useful to him. But he seemed much inclined to go to sea. In order to keep him at home, and likewise to gratify his taste for letters, the lad was bound apprentice to his elder brother, who had lately set up a printing office in Boston. Here he had many opportunities of reading new books and of hearing instructive conversation. He exercised himself so successfully in writing compositions that when no more than 13 or 14 years old, he became a contributor to his brother's newspaper. Ben was also a versifier, if not a poet. He made two doleful ballads, one about the shipwreck of Captain Wortholake, and the other about the pirate Blackbeard, who not long before infested the American seas. When Ben's verses were printed, his brother sent him to sell them to the townspeople, wet from the press. Buy my ballads, shouted Benjamin as he trudged through the streets with a basket full in his arm. Who'll buy a ballad about Blackbeard? A penny apiece, a penny apiece. Who'll buy my ballads? If one of those roughly composed and ruddily printed ballads could be discovered now, it would be worth more than its weight in gold. In this way, our friend Benjamin spent his boyhood and youth until, on account of some disagreement with his brother, he left his native town and went to Philadelphia. He landed in the later city a homeless and hungry young man and bought three pence worth of bread to satisfy his appetite. Not knowing where else to go, he entered a Quaker meeting house, sat down, and fell fast asleep. He has not told us whether his slumbers were visited by any dreams, but it would have been a strange dream indeed, and an incredible one, that should have foretold how great a man he was destined to become, 
and how much he would be honored in that very city where he was now a friendless and unknown. So here we finish our story of the childhood of Benjamin Franklin. One of these days, if you would know what he was in his manhood, you must read his own works and the history of American independence. And we'll go on with the next story from the American Experience Storybook in our next video. Thanks so much for watching. Hey, please reach down, click like, and subscribe, and come back for another one. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.